Welcome to Face to Face. Our guest today is Siddharth Sah. He is a member of the executive team of the Peabody Sex Museum. Actually, he is the first uh, Indian to hold a such high profile position of any major museums in the United States. And also he is the curator of uh, Indian and South Asian art at uh, Peabody a Sex Museum, which has the largest collection of modern Indian art outside India. So Siddharth, welcome to our show and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Sure. Now, I have a lot of questions about you that how you got interested into Indian art and all this stuff here. But before that, I just uh, let's first get into, I'm told that uh, Peabody Sex Museum is going to open uh, Indian art uh, gallery or wing uh, later this year. So tell us about that, how big it is, what you will have there. Yeah, sure. So it is, um, as you mentioned, we have the largest collection of modern Indian painting outside of India. And we're the only museum, not just in the US, but um, outside of India that has a permanent gallery devoted to post-independence art from India. Hmm. Um, so what's been happening is I've been here for about two and a half years. And since the entire time that I've been here, I've been working on going through all of our collections from South Asia and re imagining or reinterpreting how they can be displayed and then now reinstalling them. So this includes a small gallery. It's the Fadia Deshpande Gallery of Historic Material. Uh, uh, Fadia Deshpande, like Fadia, Prasant Fadia, who was an uh, entrepreneur who passed away uh, many years ago. And then uh, Deshpande, Des Deshpande Foundation. Des right? Deshpande, the, the family foundation. Family yes, foundation. those were the two. The, so the gallery is named um, in honor of the, the Fadia Foundation and the Deshpande Family Foundation. Perfect. And so that is the historic gallery. And then we have the modern art gallery, which opens as well, the Hurwitz Gallery, named after Chester and Davida Hurwitz of Worcester, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. who were the ones collecting this work for about 30 years um, between approximately 1970 to 2000. Um, and along with that, we will have a small gallery for a temporary exhibition for one year based on the illustrated correspondence between the Hurwitzes and the many Indian artists that they, that they bought art from. So it's telling the story of their journeys in India, but through the um, illustrated letters from artists in India and many photographs as well from their trips there. So when that part of the gallery is opening, when? Do you have any date or? November 27th. No, and it, was supposed to, it was supposed to open in June. It was going to be the second anniversary at Peabody Essex for me. It's going to be my birthday as well. Oh, and my right. parents were going to be here to come join in the celebration. But because, you know, these obvious reasons, um, we've not been able to open. And now it opens November 27th. So now is that also going to be virtual because we are still, we are not sure whether they will be gathering or not. I know. Yes, it will be virtual. Um, the, the museum is open now. I mean, the galleries, the South Asian galleries are not, but the museum has opened. And so people will be able to come and visit the works in person. Uh, mm. It's just timed, you know, it's limited occupancy. We're following very strict protocol, but there will be all kinds of virtual content. I've been doing talks. I did a talk this morning. I will be doing another talk tomorrow. I'm doing talks all the way into December to also help promote the collection and be showing images from the, the newly installed galleries. Uh, very good. Now, uh, do you have any idea that how many pieces of Indian art are there at the museum, Peabody Sex Museum? That's a hard question. I believe, so South Asia, I am South responsible Asia, yes. for approximately 12 or 13,000 objects. 12 or 13,000 objects. From uh -huh. broader South Asia, which sure. also includes like Southeast Asia. Sure, in, in my, in my sure. Under my umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, from India, the Hurwitz collection is about 1,400 works mm -hmm. um, of post-independence art. Um, we have between five and 600 Kaligat paintings from Bengal. Mm -hmm. um, hundreds of clay figures. I'm really bringing these out. Like uh, They're very realistic clay figures about this big. Of, from the 19th century of different Indian occupations. So these mm. are made in Bengal of different types of Indians. So it's quite problematic from a colonial perspective, but mm. they're also beautiful to see. And we have several hundred of those as well. So it's an immense amount of work that we have. And there's treasures still that I just go in storage and unearth and didn't even know that we had. Mm -hmm. oh, excellent. So now let's come back to you. Mm -hmm. 
And um, uh, you were born here in the US, you were brought up here, you were raised here. How did you get interested in uh, Indian art? Yeah, so um, I think it's because I, I grew up in a house, I grew up outside of Chicago and in a very like proper Indian Gujarati Hindu family. So mm. my mother never, still doesn't wear Western clothes. She, mm. she always like has a dot on her head. We're very, very traditional in that way. And she believed that anywhere you stood in the house, that you should see God or God should see you. And so she had all kinds of, not just Hindu imagery everywhere, but, and I do in my home as well, but from all different kinds of traditions. And so I feel like my love of art was actually more a love of, of beautiful things and the love of things with stories. Because, you know, as a child, you might not understand that that's a god, but you know something about the story of that Krishna with the cow, you know, something like that. So I was interested in, in that. And um, my father is a retired surgeon. My brother also went to medical school and I refused to dissect anything. I never even studied biology. I was mm -hmm. very, very different. And I fell in love with art history when I was 15 in mm -hmm. high school. And from then on, I just decided to pursue it. And my parents certainly thought I should do something more practical. I thought when my undergrad, I went to Johns Hopkins University. I thought maybe I'll do international relations. And I immediately just stuck with art history and I stayed with it through. So I had a sense when I was a little child. And then as a teenager, I really became more clear about it. And now uh, before coming to uh, Peabody Sex Museum, where, where, what did you do before that? So I was working on my PhD in South Asian art at Columbia University. And I was um, in London doing dissertation research because I was writing my, my dissertation at the time. And it was based on British India, Victorian India. I wrote about um, how the British not only had to assert power over India, but how they had to look the part as well. So how the British styled themselves as imperial rulers, but using symbols and objects from India. So there was like the Kohinoor diamond was something I wrote about. I wrote about fashion history as well and study of photography and the use of Indian people as decoration and spectacles. So where you'd have like the Delhi Durbars mm -hmm. and the British royalty there, but then all these turban Indian princes, they're like decoration. And so I um, was doing my dissertation research in London and I moved here from there when I got this job and then finished my dissertation while starting the job here. Oh, right. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been juggling since I arrived. At first it was the PhD and then the job and now it's the job and this new appointment, as you mentioned, of Director of Education and Civic Engagement. So I'm constantly juggling. Uh, excellent. Now, uh, other question for you is, um, when you talk about the Indian art, and I'm sure by working on the Indian art and South Asian art, uh, you are also exposed to artwork in Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, other South Asian countries. Do you see any difference between the art from these different countries or basically the basic concept is the same? So I used to actually, before even doing the PhD, I was a dealer, I sold art and I specialized in Nepalese art. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to Nepal regularly and there are differences. They're not essentially the same. Let's say if we take art from Pakistan, and you know, mm -hmm. like that's a generalization or art from sure. India. There's so many kinds of art in India. Sure, sure. But if you take art from Pakistan, um, which as it's by its nature is like a, is a, is a Muslim country. Islam, sure. So, so there will be potentially less figurative work in certain cases, less people because of certain like, you know, regulations that some people feel than in Indian art where it's Hindu art will have lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's, there's differences like there, but in Nepal, like looking at Nepalese Hindu art, um, you know, the goddess will be called Mahalakshmi. Mm -hmm. But when you look at Mahalakshmi as an Indian Hindu, I don't recognize her because mm -hmm. she's not holding the same things in her hands. Or Ganesh, mm -hmm. for example, he holds, he doesn't hold his tusk in mm -hmm. Nepal. He holds muli, like the radish, white radish in his hand. Oh, okay. Um, so there's certain iconographical differences that will happen. So I don't think that they're, they're all the same. And I was in this talk today where people were asking, is there some dominant thread that you can see throughout Indian art or all of South Asian art. And I don't think there is. I think that mm -hmm. there's so much diversity on the subcontinent mm -hmm. um, that, that the art expresses that as well. So how do you define 
uh, modern art, for example, like in, 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 in general sense, for example, like say, you know, I want to talk about modern art, but this modern art can be Europe from Europe or from Latin America, or from US or from South Asia or East Asia. So what is the definition of modern art? This is a great question you're asking in this panel. I just did a panel, as I mentioned, with the Jungir Nicholson Art Foundation in Mumbai. It was three lectures over three weeks. And the big question was modern and contemporary. How do we define that? Mm -hmm. um, in the context of India specifically, some people will say that, that modern art relates to partition, post-partition. So things for after 1947, but then they talk about, so artists from the 1940s like Raza, um, Souza, Hussein, these are names that are synonymous with like the moments. I, I'm come back to Hussein a little bit later, but let's okay. go ahead. Sure. Mm -hmm. These are artists associated with partition and then contemporary would be artists that are more current now. But actually that definition is very, very problematic. I mean, uh, Raja Ravi Varma in the late 19th century and early 20th century is a modern artist in his own way because it's not the same kind of art that was being done in the pre-modern times. He's painting in oil. So that those are problematic words, modern with Indian art. In general, modernism is a tricky, tricky world. Okay. Now, since you mentioned uh, M.F. Hussein, of course, growing up in India, and I was quite exposed to his... Uh, his artwork in Delhi, in, in, uh, in New Delhi. Yeah. And also we noticed that his artwork was very, very controversial. And uh, so if you can, and also I'm told that uh, the Peabody Sex Museum has one of the largest collections of uh, his paintings, modern paintings. So just throw some light on Abba Hussein and his artwork and the controversy related with him. Sure. So M.F. Hussein, you know, his career really begins at the moment of partition, 1947. And he is a part of a group of artists from all different faiths. So there's um, Souza, who is Christian from Goa. You have multiple Hindu artists there. You have Muslim artists all coming together to think of what the art is going to be for a new secular nation. Because India's intention at the moment of partition was to be a democratic, secular nation where all people, regardless of class or religion, were to have equal rights in the country. So going into the 60s and 70s and 80s, you actually see Hussein is kind of becoming like a state painter. There's a national stamp with his work. Indira Gandhi, he's doing all of these paintings with in, like Indira Gandhi as like the theme. And this was actually a point of conflict that many people had with Hussein, other artists, because he was quite strongly pro Indira Gandhi mm -hmm. at moments when other artists were like, absolutely no to Indira Gandhi. And then of course, this kind of, um, the controversy started around the 1990s when people had seen in particular, it was a map of India that he had done. And uh, people were upset uh, that he had painted uh, India as a nude, as a nude figure. Of course, somebody like myself who has studied the art of India for over 20 years now knows that of all of the religious art of the world, Hindu art is by far the most sensuous and erotic of all mm. art um, mm. connected to religion. So mm. it's, it, this is one of the interesting things, but somehow this moment shifted in the 90s um, following a lot of riots in 1992 and, you know, uh, where Hussein started being attacked for offending religious sentiments in particular because of these representations of, of nudity in some of his works, not all of them by far, in some okay. of them. Well, you now you just brought another interesting topic, the, the sensuousness of uh, Indian art. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about that, you know, what... Yeah. Uh, uh, what what is the factor? What are the some of the sensual elements in, in in Indian art? So it pervades so much of our culture. If we think of the word sensual or sense sensual, it has to do mm -hmm. with the senses. Mm -hmm. And I explain to people that the experience of going into a Hindu temple is a very sensory, sensual experience because there's noise, there's always noise. There's smells overpowering with the smell of incense. There's so mm. much to look at, the flowers, the shine, everything. You touch the God or you, you receive something. All of the senses are immersed in the divine, in our, in our tradition. Um, and when you think of like devotional poetry, like Mirabai's songs to Krishna, she is singing to him, or Antal in South India, 
singing to the gods um, as if they are lovers. And mm -hmm. we have the union of like Radha and Krishna or Shiva and Shakti, that, that the, the relationship with the divine can be one of union with the divine. Mm -hmm. And so that is expressed in, in the art in many different ways. But in the earliest forms of Hindu art and in early Buddhist art, um, you see even on stupas, you see beautiful women carved into the walls, like hang, holding trees and things, because the, the female body was also an emblem of fertility and mm -hmm. fecundity. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is a lot, legacy of this kind of very sensory uh, veneration of the gods. Okay. Now, it seems that you have a very intriguing um, uh, concept and a style of mixing these two things. Uh, when you were growing up, I think earlier you mentioned that uh, your mother will have, you know, statues all over, so you can see it from anywhere. Somehow, did that influence your upbringing and growing up? Yeah. As, huh? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, I am so grateful for that experience I had growing up. Like my mother would never say that she likes art. She doesn't. Mm -hmm. She doesn't like say she understands art, but she loves beauty and she loves like any kind of religious thing. And my, mm -hmm. my grandmother would even in India, we would see Mother Teresa come on television. My grandmother would bow. And I remember thinking, oh, as a little child, oh, but she's Christian and you're Hindu. But they didn't have that barrier in my family. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. just respect for these holy people. Mm -hmm. And so I do feel that growing up surrounded by these images that I really um, fell in love with them. And I've also myself have been practicing. I mean, I, I practice the religion. Um, mm -hmm. And I did my master's in Advaita Vedant um, no, really? and in the tradition of Swami Dhan and the Saraswati. It was mm -hmm. um, in Vedant and Jungian psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of doing counseling therapy with Hindu philosophy as a part mm -hmm. of it. But mm -hmm. where it gets a little difficult is that, um, you know, and I don't need to go into it in this space, but is that um, I represent a very liberal, forward, left view of of the Hindu, <laughs> Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I am very embracing of, of all religions and a plurality of religions, including my own. Um, no. But I also seek to speak out for the rights of, of, of others. Sure. Uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned Carl Jung. And um, I mean, what an amazing philosophy and his uh, research and uh, his impact on psychology. And since you know both the, the, the religion as well as uh, psychology, do you think somehow Carl Jung was influenced by Hinduism or he had at least some impact or he had read? Definitely, definitely, definitely. But I would almost say it's not just Hinduism that uh, there's definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. It was an interest in what to him as a European was kind of esoteric Eastern philosophies. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, he had an interest in his, the Red Book, which is this like illustrated amazing uh, yeah. book that he worked on. You can see a lot of like yantras in there or mandalas, sacred geometry. This exists in Tibetan Buddhism. It exists in Tantric Hinduism. It exists in various forms. And I think Jung had a very open and expansive approach to spirituality that mm -hmm. included Hinduism among various other traditions. Mm -hmm. I'm and glad he, you mentioned the Red Book because I did read that book when it came yeah. out. Yeah. I had to wait about three months in the public library to wait for it. Waited three months and got it and it was a really big, thick book. But also it also shows an aspect of Carl Jung that he was just not a psychologist. He was a fantastic artist and drawer. He, I mean, he, some of his paintings, you have the drawings is totally mind boggling that he was able to do that. It's so true. Yeah, yeah. He really is like a mystic himself. He was quite a mystic himself. Sure. Okay. So now, uh, as we are coming to uh, towards the end of this uh, interview, as I told you, warn you that we, I'm going to give you some uh, a fireside, uh, you know, chat or questions to you, and sure. let's see. And everything, whatever you answer, it should be in the context of art. Okay. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing. So for example, say when I say um, Ganesha, for example, so what comes in your mind? 
Ganesha, I think of the fact that he's a combination of four creatures. He's an elephant head, human body, rides like a screw mouse, a mouse, and he often wears a serpent um, and so around his belly. And so it's actually man and snakes are opposite to each other and elephants are and mice are like opposites to each other. So that's what comes to mind when I think of Ganesh. Iconography. Sure. Uh, and what about uh, like some of these, um, you, you mentioned earlier, the the sensuous uh, artwork in India. So the say when you think about the, these pictures and the, the statues of um, you know in, in old temples like Khuzrao, etc. What comes to your mind? Chola bronzes. Immediately, I think of Chola bronzes uh, because those bronzes from South India are just the 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 shapes of the bodies and the sheen of the metal is just so incredibly beautiful um mm. so that's what i think of south indian bronzes uh, rajasthan in india you know when i think of rajasthan i think of the um the headpiece that the women wear there you know there's often this like circular uh, jeweled object that is here i'm fascinated by those i don't know what they're called and uh, uh, what about, are you exposed to Madhubani art in Bihar, from Bihar? A little bit, yes, yes, a little bit, yeah. Okay, so when I say Madhubani art, what, what do you think? What, what I think to? immediately about an eye in profile. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, there'll, there'll be like one eye in profile. Uh, Indian women. I think of um, sari fabric. I think immediately of like Bandhani sari is what I think of. Sari, yes, yeah, okay. And what about Indian men? I think of turbans, but I also think of how, and that is a very colonialist kind of thing. It's like the turban, but I think like in Rajasthan and like the Rabari people of Gujarat, the, the beautiful Indian men who wear these incredible turbans and then have amazing gold earrings and how, how like just beautiful that looks. Uh, modern Indian art. I think of um, a lot, very emotional and expressive art that is expressing uh, traumas of the past in very, very powerful ways. And modern art from Pakistan. Oh, um, I see. I'm, this is an area I know very little about, but the talk I was in this morning was about this. I just see um, not so different from art in Bombay. Mm -hmm. Similar okay. at the same time. Uh, so now your last word on the the uh, museum of uh, the Peabody Sex Museum and the uh, upcoming wing and uh, Indian art. I am so proud of the work that we have done in these new galleries. And when I've been working on them, I've been thinking of future generations. I've been thinking of people in my generation who are in their 40s, but also of their children. And so future generations connection to India. And so that is what I've had in mind is how young people are going to understand the story of India in the future. I'm really Siddharth, excited. thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking with you, and I'm sure we'll touch base again. I hope so. Thank you for having me. Thank you.